I've ever heard. That's awesome. Did you write that, Jason? No. Okay, all right. Well, you can say yes if you want. Just lie. Well, I'll give you credit. That's what it's about. Advent. The ancient longing. The, the, the joining with the ancients of Israel saying, Oh, come. When are you going to come, Lord? When is the deliverer coming? When is the redeemer coming? We're so, so ready for the Messiah to redeem us. Today we light the candle of hope. And it's going to be so awesome to see where God takes us in the scriptures. What do you think of when you hear the word hope? Now, if you're like me, you know I think of everything in terms of movie quotes. I can't help it. So when I was thinking of hope, and I was praying about this this week, this is what came to mind. Anybody else? Can, can, can anybody finish this sentence? Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. You're my only hope. Oh, good. 17 of you knew that. That's impressive. You're my only hope. Hope. That's what we talk about today. And I'm pretty sure that's not the only Star Wars reference coming your way today. So just a little heads up. Hope. What do you think? Have you ever been to the point where you had a lot of hope? And have you ever been on the other extreme where you were hopeless? Where the night was really dark. You couldn't wait for that sun to come up. Whether that was literally or figuratively in your life. For two fishermen leaving Montauk, Long Island. They were heading out into the deep sea to do a massive haul of fish. Their names were Anthony and John. Here's a photo of them. And they were heading out, and they had everything ready. And as they went out 40 miles offshore into the Atlantic Ocean, Anthony went downstairs to sleep below deck. True story. This is last year. John decided to go up top and start getting prepared for the big haul that they would soon be pulling in. Well, while Anthony slept soundly like a baby, John was struggling to get a compartment open, and he started to pull on that handle harder and harder. Finally, he couldn't get it to budge, and he pulled with all his might, and the handle broke, and it sent him sprawling backwards off the edge of the deck into the ocean. It's just one problem. That boat was on autopilot, and it kept going and going, and his buddy was fast asleep down in the cabin. And as he came up over the water, he started to look, and he was bobbing. He could see with each time he would come up, that boat was further and further away. And he screamed, and he yelled, and he waved his hands. He didn't have a life vest. And he's sitting there in that ocean watching his hope get smaller and smaller until finally he watched it, and it went over a wave, and it was gone. And there he was floating in the Atlantic Ocean with no one even aware he's off the edge can you imagine that? He's there without a life vest, knowing this is probably the way I am going to die. If there's ever been a hopeless feeling, can you imagine coming out of the water and looking, and that is your only sight? He sat there for a minute, trying not to panic, and he realized his boots were strangely buoyant. He had on rubber fishing boots, and he had an idea. If I could take these off, and empty the water out and plunge them down, upside down into the water, just maybe that trapped air would float, and it did. And he took his other one off, and he tucked it under each arm. And just for that moment, he had a glimmer of hope. Just a flicker, just a, just a flame. Maybe I can survive the next hour. Maybe somebody will come looking for me. Maybe my guy, who's fast asleep, will wake up, see I'm missing, and turn the boat around. Maybe. And that's how hope is. Just that maybe, just that flicker. But the hours passed, and the hours passed, and it started to dawn on him that no one was anywhere even aware he was off the boat. No one was aware he was even in the water. Oh, that is except for two sharks that were swimming 15 feet near him. And at the moment, they hadn't been terribly interested in him yet. As he sat there bobbing, he's thinking, what do I do? How do I, kindle, how do I give up? Do I, do, I, do I kindle hope? Do I just swallow the water and go under and save myself the pain of hypothermia and what's about to happen as this sun slowly goes down. <clears throat> Meanwhile, four hours later, back on the boat, Anthony wakes up from a nice nap. And he goes stretching and looking for his buddy John, and he can't find him. And he sees a broken handle, and he puts it together what's happened. And he panics. And he immediately radios the Coast Guard and says, you got to help. you got to come find this guy. Where did he fall off? I don't know. How long ago has it been? I don't know. And he said, sir, I'm the commander of the Coast Guard, and i got to tell you, we don't hold out much hope of finding your buddy. I'm just being honest. 
You can't tell me where. You don't even know. You have like 50 square miles he could be. That's if he's still alive. How long ago was it? I don't know. It could be hours. We'll send out the look. We'll, we'll put out the search and we'll put out the all points bulletin. But I got to be honest with you. We don't hold much hope for finding John. So John is there trying to keep his spirits up, setting short-term goals. John, just get through the hour. John, just get through the next hour. John, think of your children. John, fill that boot back up with air. Try to get through. If I can just get through the, just get through the night. If I can just see the sun come up, maybe, just maybe, then I have a chance of being rescued. And the sun comes up. Still no sign of boats or aircraft or anything. Then he's looking on the horizon, and he thinks he sees just a little bobbing of something. And he thinks it's a boat, and he swims towards it. And the hope starts to flicker within him, and then he realizes it's not a boat, it's a buoy anchored to the bottom, a fishing buoy. Well, he climbs on board. He's thinking, okay, now I've got a little bit of hope. Maybe I'll just sit here and swing with this. And, and, and then a half hour passes. And then another hour passes, and he's holding on for dear life, and then he thinks he hears that unmistakable Coast Guard helicopter. And it comes closer, and he's panicking, and he's flashing everything he's got of his clothes, and he's splashing and screaming. And finally, the chopper turns around and heads right towards him, and it flies past him. But it turns, and it comes back, and it sees him. And they let down the ladder, and they rescue him. While he's sitting there being rescued, and they've got, they, they tend to him, and they, they, they take him to the ambulance, the Coast Guard guy looks at him, and he says a most amazing sentence. He says, we are so glad to find you. We have been looking for you for nine hours. And he looks at him, without Mr. B, he says, well, I have been looking for you for 13. <laughs> I have been waiting for you. You are my hope. And he lived to tell about it. In fact, here he is talking to the news reporters with his boot still under his arm that saved his life. What an amazing story of hope. And hope is the fuel of Advent, church. Hope is our fuel that this life isn't all there is. That the struggles we face, there is something better coming. Jesus, our Emmanuel, God with us. That's what Advent means. It means the coming. It means the arrival. If you've never heard or studied on Advent, that's what it means. It's where we get to pause and all the hectic, crazy busyness and all the shopping and all the visits from family members who look like Cousin Eddie and all these things that stress us out. That's why I love Advent. Because we can call a timeout and catch our breath and say, there is something far bigger than myself in this world. There is something so much better going on, and that is the story of God's redeeming love. And that's what we look forward to. And we join with the ancient past. We prepare our hearts. It's an opportunity for us to align with God's presence rather than focus on just presence. See what I did there? How's your heart? More importantly, how's your level of hope today? On your little hopo meter, where are you? You a four, five, seven, eight, ten? One? Oh, you came to the right place today if you need a fresh dose of hope. Today we're going to light the first candle. Let me have my, my helper come up. We're going to light four candles over the next four weeks. The first one is the candle of hope. Then we light the candle of joy, peace, and love. And then finally, at the end of this journey, we light the white candle that we bring out on Christmas Eve. This first candle represents the flame through all the chaos, through all the fear, through all the pain, through all the panic that we face, that there is a flicker of hope no matter what you're dealing with, no matter what the doctor told you, no matter what your bank statement tells you, no matter what your team losing yesterday tells you, <laughs> there is hope. There is hope. Isaiah is the poster prophet for hope. He's the poster child. He, 700 years before Jesus even showed up, was writing a letter, and he says, how long, oh God? How long will it be before you come? Now, let me ask you a question. Do we like to wait? <laughs> Thank you. One honest person. I mean, seriously, be honest. Do you ever wake up in the morning and say, oh, I got to go to Walmart today? I just can't wait to do my Christmas shopping at the Walmart and I hope, oh, I hope, oh, I hope, when I get to the checkout, they only have one open. <laughs> Does anybody ever say that? Because I just can't wait to wait and wait and wait. No, we don't say that. Man, our blood pressure goes up. Oh, what are you kidding? You got 37 checkout registers and one person working? What is wrong with you? And that should be a crime. We don't like to wait. 
We don't like to wait at all. In fact, man, if it's, if it's Black Friday, oh, man, you can forget it. Black Friday. Just think about that. This is so important. I love this. This is when people trample others for cheap goods mere hours after being thankful for what they already have. I love that lady's face in the middle, <laughs> looking right at the camera. Black Friday, being grateful the day before. Black Friday. We're just going to park here for a minute, okay? This came across my social media feed. i got to show it. So y'all can shop Black Friday at 4 a.m., but 10 a.m. church is too early. I guess God doesn't rank as high as a $20 crock pot. Oh, yeah, I said it. $20 crock These people are killing each other over this, and we don't like to wait. And we, y'all, if you're going shopping on Black Friday, may the odds be ever in your favor because that is something that is so, I just, I don't get it. I'm like Israel. How long, oh God, before they open up another register? How long, oh God, before you deliver us? And just like we feel today, they were no different. I mean, it was different, so they didn't have Walmart. But all the way back from Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, all the way going up to, through uh, Jeremiah and Isaiah and all these prophets, they had devotion to God and then they neglected God went up and down. They had times of feast and they had times of famine. They had good times and they had bad times. When things were good, they turned towards God. And when things were bad, well, God, where are you? I guess he's not there. They're no different than us. Isaiah comes along and he unleashes a nuclear bomb of hope. Go ahead and open your Bibles to Isaiah 7 or pull up your favorite Bible app. I'm going to read from the New King James, the NKJV today, if you want to follow along. While you pull that up, let me welcome our online campus. Great to have you with us this week. Happy Advent to you. If you're a first-time guest with us this morning, I hope you've stopped by the Welcome Center. We have a gift for you. It's a really cool gift bag, some good stuff in there, not just a little cheesy stuff, some good stuff. If you won't take the bag, I will. So just go back there and see Miss Shannon after church. We want to thank you for being our guest. All right, let me set the context, because context is key when you read, especially in the Old Testament. Isaiah, one of the major prophets here, is writing a lot about hope, and, and I'm so grateful he did. And as he shares these hopeful stories, you need to know that Isaiah was a very prominent public figure in Israel. He was very famous in, in his day, but he wasn't popular, okay? There's a huge difference. You know why he wasn't popular? Because he was bold, and he wasn't afraid to tell the truth to the general public and to kings, he would be known to go up to people and say things like, hey, God doesn't like the way you're cheating those poor people. Knock it off. Anybody want to hear that? They don't want to hear that. The rich people want to keep their rich money. And then he would go up to kings and he would say something, hey, your ancient enemy is going to come in, invade your country, and take you captive. <laughs> Have a good day. He would say things like that. He was so bold. He was so full of hope. And he was the poster prophet for hope and for waiting. So with that as our context, Remember, this is 700 years before Jesus, and listen to the prophecies he's about to talk about, the coming Messiah. Isaiah 7, 14, it says this, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name, what? Emmanuel. We just sang that. Now skip over two chapters to Isaiah 9, verse 2. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Can you imagine living in that ancient world and having 400 years of silence about to come upon you, and you're wondering where the Messiah is, and you can go back and read words like that? Can you imagine the hope? that that shared with the people. Now fast forward a few hundred years from Isaiah to Luke, and we have the famous Christmas story. Now we all know it cold. We read Luke 1 and Luke 2, and we think, oh, that's great, it gives me warm fuzzies and stuff, and you know, we think about the Christmas movies out there, and it just, it just takes us to that place, but we overlook something. Before we get to the manger, before we get to Jesus, there was another guy who had to wait, and wait with hope, and his name was Zechariah. And Zechariah was a priest, who Luke described as very righteous and blameless. And he was a good Jewish follower of God. And he had everything going for him. He had a great wife. And everyone loved this guy. And undoubtedly, he had deep longings for the Messiah that had been promised. But there was just one issue. He hadn't come yet. But he knew the prophecies because he was a priest. So he's going about his priestly duties. He's having a normal day. And all of a sudden, an angel shows up and says, Behold, you are about to give birth to the forerunner of the Messiah. You and your wife are going to have a baby. And that's what he would come to know as John the Baptist. 
And he's going to come. He's going to prepare the way for the Lord. There's just one problem. They couldn't have kids. This was a total shock. This is, now think about this. It's been 400 years since Israel has had a clear prophetic voice or message from God. By the time Luke writes this, 400 years of silence. And this is the breaking of it. Now, 400 years, we don't picture that, but put it in context. America is only 242 years old. So that's, think about how much longer. Jamestown had just been settled 400 years ago. Henry Hudson had just discovered Hudson Bay. Johannes Kepler, the famous scientist, was just coming up with the planetary laws 400 years. Think about that, okay? So we're talking a long time of silence, of waiting, of people still trying to kindle hope when honestly they didn't quite feel like being hopeful. So when an angel shows up and tells Zechariah, hey, you're going to have a son who will go before the Lord in the spirit of Elijah to make ready a people prepared for the Messiah. Zechariah knew this was a huge deal. He knew the prophecies. And he's like, what are you talking about? This is a big deal. But again, they couldn't have kids. So he's like, I don't understand what's going on. This doesn't compute. But he still had hope. So when Zechariah hears this message, hey, guys, you're about to be parents, imagine the hope that sprang up with him. Because they wanted kids. It was a stigma back then if you didn't have kids. Like, oh, Zechariah, Elizabeth, oh, such good people. Yeah, what a shame. Never could have kids. They hear the condescending whispers behind their back. God should have blessed them. <laughs> he's a priest, but he, something, they must have done something wrong. Do you hear that? The stigma back then. This is so amazing. And then he shows up and the prophesied one to come in the spirit of Elijah is happening to this guy. Hope is still here. God is still with us. He's still coming. He hasn't forgotten. Hope is alive in Israel and everything is going to be great. And we think, well, that's awesome for them. Because maybe you're sitting here today and you're thinking, this sounds so great for those people way back then, but where is my hope? Because when I read about Zechariah and Elizabeth, they weren't facing cancer. What about me? That's great for them, but where's my hope? Because they don't have unpaid bills and doctor bills and children looking for Christmas presents on Christmas morning, and I have no clue how to buy them. That's great for them, but they didn't lose their job last week. What about me? What about my hope, Pastor? Mm. That's where it gets real. And if that's you and you're feeling that way, there is hope. Let me encourage you, don't give up. Don't abandon hope. You came to the right place today. I want to share with you a few ways that we can rekindle our hope, that we can reconnect with God's hope this Advent season, no matter what your circumstance is. First off, the very first thing we need to do to rekindle hope, it must be based on his word. Hope has to be based on God's word or it's based on man's shifting opinions. It has to be. Our hope is based on this book, on the promises in this book. On all the prophecies that every single one of them, 300 about the Messiah, came true. This is where our hope is found. So when fake news tells you this, or this comes up and says, oh, this, and this is the end of the world, or it's going to... No, no. We read the end of the story. And there is hope. If you know the Savior. If you know the hope that is based on God's word. It isn't changing from time to time. These are promises to his people. Not only long ago, but to you today. It's a beacon of hope. Let me put this in modern day terms so we can understand. How many people recognize what this is right here? Yes. Anybody know which lighthouse? Cape Hatteras. Good. How many knew that? Nice. Nice. This is a beacon. You can see this for miles if you're out in the ocean. For miles. It is a beacon cutting through the darkest night. And when sailors see that and they were lost, that gave them hope because hope penetrates the darkness. No matter what kind of pain, you are never alone. God with us means he is always with us. And nothing, nothing, nothing can change that. Not your circumstances, not the devil, not the diagnosis. Nothing changes the fact that God is with us. And maybe you just needed to hear that today. Maybe that's your truth nugget that you take with you. The second way we can rekindle hope is to put our focus on God's character, on who he is, on who he promises to be. Do you believe his promises? Think about this. There's a great story in the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 5, and it's so easy to overlook. It's a great story of hope that I love because it's about a woman that we never know her name. So significant, she makes it into Scripture, but we never know her name. And she's got this issue. For 12 years, she's had an issue of blood. She's been bleeding somehow, and people think she's unclean, and she's been written off, and she's an outcast from society. And she's tried doctor after doctor after doctor, and she has paid everything she's got, and now she's flat broke. And in fact, she feels worse. She doesn't have any hope. And then she hears whispers 
that there's this guy coming to town. It's not Santa. It's Yeshua. Jesus, the miracle worker. He's coming into town, and she has heard the whispers. She has heard the stories and the miracles and the healing, and she has believed, and hope has awoken inside her. It has flickered up, the hope of healing, the hope of a new life, and it's drove her to take action. She says, if I can just get close enough to touch his clothes, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I will be healed. You think that was easy for her? She's weakened by her constant illness. If you've ever had somebody in your life that you've cared for with a chronic long-term illness, it's no joke. And she works her way through the crowd who doesn't like her, who's, what are you doing here? You're unclean. What are you? And she's weak, and she's trying to push through the crowd that's clamoring around, and the noise, and the people are thronging around. And she reaches out, and she touches him. And she says, in a minute, she's healed, and her hope is rewarded. And then all of a sudden, her emotions crash because the Lord, the one she touched, turns around and says, who touched me? And his disciples are like, what are you doing? Who touched you? Master, there's people bumping in. It's like a slam dance going on down here. Everybody's touching you. And you stop and you go, who touched me? And they laugh. One girl doesn't laugh. The one who touched him goes. And in that moment, you know she froze. It probably seemed like an eternity. What have I done? Because she's conflicted. Because in one moment, she's healed. She's feeling great. But in the next moment, she's like, I'm busted. I'm so in trouble. This Messiah said, whoa, stop the parade. What is, who touched me? I love it. You, you don't think she was afraid? She, what presumption? She didn't ask permission. An unclean person came and touched another man. Think about this. Look at, here's what scripture said. This is the fear that she actually had. But the woman, fearing and trembling, that's fright, came. Here, and she know what happened to her. She came and she fell down before him and told Jesus the whole truth. And I love this because Jesus gets so mad at her. He's like, I can't believe, woman, if I've told you once, I've told you a thousand times, don't you touch me. No, that's not what he says at all. I love this. Look at Jesus. He says to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? Go in peace. Oh, by the way, be healed of your affliction. <laughs> Forget the affliction. I want the peace. And he heals her. That is our God. And he offers hope. That is our God. That is his character. That is the one who changed this lady's life. He fulfilled Israel's hope. He's fulfilled humanity's hope when he raised from the dead. And he's going to fulfill all hope when he comes back for the second advent. And he sets all things new for those who know him. That's why he left us a bold promise saying, I am with you always from here on out till the end of the age. Because of promises like that, that hope fuels me. And it gets me through awful days. And it gets me through the tough weeks. Because God's character is true. And he's trustworthy. And Jesus is so good. And he is so worthy. This lady comes, and because she has an interaction with Emmanuel, with God with us, her life has changed. And she has a new hope. Now, for you Star Wars fans, you know this is just crying out for me to put up this poster, Star Wars, A New Hope. But I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to make a Star Wars reference here. I'm actually going to make a Rogue One reference. This isn't a Star Wars. This is, this is a spinoff. This doesn't count. This doesn't count because it's not technically in the Star Wars canon. There's a scene where these guys, these, these band of good guys rebels, have to go steal the plans for that giant monstrosity. What's that called? The Death Star. But it's a futile, futile mission. In fact, they call it a suicide mission, and nobody believes her. And they're like, Jen Urso, the girl in the middle there, you are a fool. This is a fool's errand, and it is suicide to march into the rebel bases or the imperial bases and try to steal these plans. You will die. What hope do we possibly have? And she looked at him, and she says, where is your faith? We have hope. Rebellions are built on hope. Spoiler alert, they go on and they win because <laughs> they had hope. It's a powerful, beautiful scene where we see hope defies the odds, and it leads us to the third step here of finding hope this morning. We focus on God's faithfulness because that's where our hope is based. Hope is based on God's faithfulness. Remember and focus on those times when God has been faithful to you, where he has worked in your life, where he has delivered your children, where he has done something you've experienced him moving when you had no doubt that he was there and he was working. And maybe it's been a long time ago and you need to refresh that Rolodex and remember that. Or maybe it was recently 
And you're smiling right now because you remember a time when God has been so good and he was with you and he was faithful. Now, what does that have to do with hope? What does that have to do with hope today, Pastor? That's what I want to know. Well, we talked about this right before Thanksgiving. We talked about an attitude of gratitude. Gratitude breeds hope. Thankfulness fosters hope. Acknowledgement and appreciating what God has done brings hope. Let me show you what this looks like in real life from scriptures. A true life story of Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah, who was known as the weeping prophet because he had such a soft heart. And his heart was broken when he comes back and he sees Israel. It's been sacked in the Babylonian invasion. In 586 B.C., Israel is lying in ruins. The temple is destroyed. Don't even know where the Ark of the Covenant went. Everything they have longed for, everything they had put their hope in is gone. The walls are demolished. The city's on fire. Good people have been slain and killed, and the other ones who are left alive have been taken off as prisoners. There is nothing good about this moment. Yet look at what the weeping prophet says. Look at this scripture. He says, yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have what? Hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Who thinks like that when looking at a heap of rubble? You know who thinks like that? Someone who has the long view. Someone who has hope and the Lord and things that are not temporary. And that's the kind of faith I want. He goes on to say this in the next verse. I say to myself, the Lord's my portion, therefore I will wait for him. There's that word we don't like, don't like to wait. The Lord is good to those who what? Who hope is in him. To the one who seeks him, it is good to wait. What are you talking about, Jeremiah? Go back to weeping. That is crazy talk. It is good for those who wait for the salvation of the Lord. Did you catch that very first part? He says, yet this I call to mind, therefore I have hope. Jeremiah understood a huge truth grenade right here, church. Don't miss this. Everything has been driving to this one sentence I'm about to drop. Okay? If you miss everything, don't miss this. Take this one truth with you today. Jeremiah understood this life-changing truth. There is hope for your future when we remember what God has done in the past. Write it down. There is hope for our future when we look back and we remember how he's been faithful, how he has provided in the past, because hope sparks and it spreads like a wildfire. Hope is contagious, and it's like a living thing, and it just fosters and stirs up the hope into other people. A few years ago, I had a chance to direct a movie, and Tion was producing it, and he was, he was with the camera. We were out in the field one night. We got permission to have this huge set built where we have this old wagon that had been destroyed. It was about the 1850s was the scenery. And this meteor crash lands and explodes this cart. And there's supposed to be a trail of flame, you know, like you see where the meteor hits and stuff. You know what I'm talking about? So we had to recreate this that night. Now, those of you who know me, I have, I have a nickname. It's Safety Pup. I want you to notice what's in Elliot's hand here. <laughs> this is lighter fluid. All right, let's uh, dim the stage lights here so we can see a little bit of what we're going to look at. I want you to notice the confused look on the pastor's face here. And then I want you to notice what's in my hand. Okay, fire extinguisher. Now I'm getting nervous about this because I know that on camera, big flame looks big cool. And I get that. I'm directing the scene. I'm happy with that. So I'm, I'm cautious. I've got my little <laughs> fire extinguisher. In the next scene, we see a little bit of fire. I'm still, notice what's still in my hand. Over here, Elliot's getting a little happier. Now, Tion is about to enter the scene. He's got the camera. Here's the boom mic. And he's about to come in. And he, as his right to say, is saying, more fire, more fire, more flames, bigger flames. And I'm behind going, no, no more flames, no more, fl well, maybe a little bit more than that. So we go to the next scene, and we see there's just a little bit more flame. It's not bad. We're getting close. I'm thinking, let's just zoom in. Let's not let the fire get out of control over here. We have a fog machine. We have some power. We got lots of straw all around. And this is wood. And... I barely know these people's land that we're on. I'm getting nervous because if this thing gets out of control, there is no way to put it out with just a tiny fire extinguisher. So I have a five-gallon bucket of water off to the side that no one knows about. Because sure enough, I thought what would happen would look like this. So I start getting nervous, right? Now I'm hearing, more fire, more fire, more flame, more, you know, and Elliot's squeezing the 
lighter fluid and they're fire, fire, and they're having a great time. And I'm getting nervous and I'm going home with the bottle of thing and I'm pouring it out as fast as they're lighting it and I'm ruining the shot because I'm getting scared because this fire is out of control in my eyes. And just like that fire, hope spreads. Hope spreads like a wildfire. And it actually is contagious to other people. When you share what God has done and you tell about his faithfulness to your children, they catch fire. When you share about what God has done and you share it with somebody else, the joy is doubled. In fact, I'm marrying in just a couple weeks Rusty Martin and and Alex, his wife, and I'm going to do it. And one of the truth grenades I'm going to share during this wedding ceremony is that simple fact that when a joy is shared, it is doubled. And when a sorrow is shared, it's cut in half. You know why? Because you have somebody to lift it with you. Because it's contagious, and your joy is doubled, and that's the beauty that God knows about marriage. It is such a powerful truth, and recognizing and appreciating the good that God has shown us in the past can increase your hope for what he's going to do for you in the future. Are you out of hope? There it is. As we nurture this living hope, it can sustain us through those dark days as you wait on God. I know you don't like to wait. I certainly don't like to wait, especially at a stoplight behind the most inept drivers on the planet. They're all here in Apex. I get it. I'm going to have our instrumentalists come up here, and I want to share one, one more story with you as they come and get in place. Have you ever seen the movie Lord of the Rings? There's this beautiful scene where here's a picture of Sam and Frodo, and they're talking, and Frodo's just about out of hope. Everything's gone wrong. He's trying to return the ring to uh, the fires of Mordor or something like that, and everything has gone wrong, and he cannot take another step. But his best friend, his faithful friend, Sam, is there to cheer him on. And he's going on. He's telling about all the great, marvelous things that have happened. And he reminds Frodo of the stories of these characters who kept going when it seemed hard. How they all found something to hold on to when everything seemed lost. And Frodo's not quite buying it. You know what he does? He looks at Sam and he says, Sam, what about us? What about, where's our hope? What do we have to hang on to? You know what Sam says? So simple. Whose response? What do we have to hang on to? That there's still good in the world. And it's worth fighting for. It's a beautiful quote. It's this moment. Everybody's got a tear in their eye. It's just so incredible. Because of Emmanuel, because God is with us, our heart agrees with him. But here's the difference. There is good in the world, but it's not anything we've done. It's a manger scene. It's because of Jesus. It's because of what he's done. Because 2,000 years ago, our Heavenly Father, for some reason, loved us so much that he wrote himself into the story, allowing his son to be born in a manger, to grow and live a sinless life, to die on a cross that he didn't deserve. A blameless, perfectly formed, flesh and bone, real living man took our cross. You think they knew that? You think mom and dad is are holding that precious baby and they're looking down on Do you think they knew at the end of the road it would be that? Do you think they saw the cross? They see the cradle. People tell them that he's going to wear a crown. You think they saw the cross? You think, they, you think they registered all of this, that his son that he's looking at and holding right now is going to be the final total payment for sin? Woo. Yes, there is good in this world, Frodo. But it's not us. It's the Holy Spirit in us. I know me. And apart from Christ, I am nothing. The good in this world is Jesus. Emmanuel. God with us. Who wrote himself into this history. Making it his story. And he wants us to know him. Do you? You can. You can know him as your Lord, as your Savior. Many of us in this room already do. And that's awesome. You can see it in your eyes. But if you don't, I'd love to introduce you to him. Would you pray with me? Let's just bow as we speak with our Heavenly Father. Lord, you are welcome in this place. God, if there's somebody here today that needs a rekindling of hope, I pray you would do that. Before we sing our last song and we leave and we go our separate ways, Lord, I lift up to you those who may not know you. God, I pray that In their own words right now, they would confess, you are Lord. You are who you say you are. Lord, help us to repent of our sin. 
to turn away from it, to agree with you that it is hideous and it is what drove you to the cross to purchase us back. Forgive us of our sin, Lord. Wipe us clean. You were the perfect sacrifice, the only way to buy us back. And we thank you that you shed your blood to take away our sin, to satisfy that debt payment. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We celebrate your advent, your first coming. We look forward to your second coming. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place to do what only you can. Would you speak to our hearts now as we continue to meet with you? In Jesus' name, amen.